a uh, quick start guide for RV generators for those of you that have bought new or looking to buy new or to have a relatively new that doesn't have a lot of hours on it. Break that thing in like you're going to use it. Work it hard. Don't pet it. Baby it around. Think you're saving it. And, and put some hours on it. Uh, I've seen motorhomes two or three years old roll through with 12 hour rolls. I mean, that's not even a good exercise time. I've got a, a, a late 18 Phaeton, and on the way up here, I noticed I think we had 1,900 hours on the generator. When we pull out of the driveway, or before we pull out of the driveway, I, I store them out in an enclosed building, and when I pull it out and back it up to the house, I crank the generator up, turn the airs on, well, I'm busy loading. I'm usually back at the shop doing something. And when I get home, we load up and go. And uh, coming up here, it ran till I stopped at a cracker barrel and spent the night there. It ran all night there. It ran all day. The rest of the day, I think I put right at 40, uh, 40, about 24 hours on it, just traveling up here. So use them. They're made to use. Uh, if you don't use them, the rings and the engines won't seat properly and, and just several things about it. It won't work properly if you don't. For those of you that do some of your own maintenance and uh, even repairs, you'll notice the, the oval red circle around the model number. The 4KY is your model number. And the last letter, in this case it's a P, and it started out as an A. So that tells you how many upgrades and changes have been made to that one unit. Over the period of uh, that unit there is actually a 14 model that they're depicting. So if you're doing that or if you're traveling, I've had a couple of people here that needed service as they're traveling, call ahead, give them this information, and that will give them the guidance to have the parts that you need when you get there. Had one uh, unit here on this location had an issue, had a code 15. Do y'all know how to retrieve your trouble codes? All right. When it shuts down, you're going to get three blinks on your start-stop switch, whether it be the one inside the coach or the one on the generator. It'll blink three times. Mash stop and release it. Don't hold it down. Just mash stop and release it, and it will give you several repetitive numbers as you watch it. That one yesterday was a 15, so it blinked once, paused, and blinked five times. That gives them the actual area that your problem is going to be in. In this person's case, it's more than likely going to be a governor's state of uh, pin loose. So that gives your service people a lot of information that they can deal with before you ever uh, get on site. Uh, main plate location, everybody can pretty well find those as a general rule. Uh, page 10, RV generators, start and stop and procedure. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff on there that you can control being on or off. Primarily your roof air, your heat, that type of stuff. Uh, your battery charging, which is your power converter or inverter converter, is pretty much on all the time. You don't turn it off. But when you're starting to stop with these units, it's stuff that you can control, like the, the air units. Turn them off, and it will uh, give that unit a lot more longevity in the area of the voltage regulator. If that thing is cranking out all it can do, and if you're back in Alabama, the temperature is 95, the humidity is 195, they're working hard. And if they're working hard and, and you shut it down, it uh, takes that regulator from pushing all it can push to, to zero. Same way start. Start them up with a lot of stuff on, uh, it's detrimental as well. Now for those of you that have all those start features, I know you can't control what it's going to do while you're away, but at the very least, leave enough on to make it reasonably comfortable when you get inside. And my coach, for instance, got three airs. We never leave all three on if we're going to be gone. We usually leave one on, but if we're in a real hot climate, we might leave two on and leave the temperature set uh, enough difference where they both don't try to come on at the same time. A lot of stuff you can control. Uh, I'll touch on automatic start features for a minute. I've had some people tell me that their voltage level gets low and then it's too low to generate more crank. Realistically, 
especially those of you that have got tens and twelve fives. Those are hard units to start. If you will set that voltage level to where that generator will crank on with the auto start at 12 volts. People think 12 volts, well that's enough. Well, it barely is. You get 11 and a half, it will not crank. So set it at 12 volts. Typically once your batteries are at peak charge, you're gonna be at 13.5 or a little better. So I'd rather it come on a little bit prematurely than it not come on at all. So if you set your auto starts to come on at 12 volts, you'll save yourself a lot of headache. Uh, mention a little bit about exercising generators. Uh, if you're in storage, uh, I don't know wintertime, ball games is about all we go to and when they're over with it's far to spring. Uh, try to run it once a month for 30 minutes, put some load on it, make it work, get hot enough to get the engine up to operate temperature and that dissipates any moisture out of the windings and, and helps keep the generator in good operating condition. We were at a rally in Renfro Valley, Kentucky. This goes back a long ways. This was probably in the mid-90s of all things. I'm up on the stage doing what I'm doing now, and the power for the whole county went down. So everybody takes off. It was summertime, it was hot. Everybody heads out to the motor home to crank the generators up. And, uh, there was one old gentleman that I know he had probably been to at least a half a dozen of my seminars and heard me preach about exercising. He comes hunting me down. He had a gasoline unit. I think it had 20 hours on it. He said, my generator won't run. <laughs> so I go out, clean his copper, and get his generator running. Hopefully he, he took, took heed to what I've been telling him. Um, Let's move over to, uh, I think it's going to be page 14 of yours, Load Management Basics. In the morning is when most of this occurs because those of you that are <clears throat> possibly running on your inverters overnight, of course you pulled your batteries down, you crank up in the morning and your battery charger is probably at peak performance. The coffee pot's on. Uh, the hot plate with the microwaves on, the wife's drying her hair, the hot water heater's on. And before you know it, you've got more on than the generator can support. So you start tripping breakers. The one key to this that I think will help you as much as anything, if you look at your power charge rate on your power converter, if it's maxed out, back it down to about 70%. 70% will take it about 30 minutes to overcome the additional charge rate it needs to produce to get your batteries back up. But that power converter is sitting there, again, at peak performance, so it's strong and most amperage it can draw. And uh, that will accommodate for probably a hair dryer and another small appliance being on inside the coach and uh, keep you get the situation where you trip records. 16's got some common items. One, uh, I keep mentioning the hair dryer. If you all will notice, 1200 to 1875 watts. The biggest generator we've got in anything out here is probably a 12.5. I don't know that I've seen one of them. Probably an eights and tens are the predominant sizes. So you start figuring it up. Doesn't take a lot of those appliances that size to accommodate what you're trying to get to, and then you still got to run your roof hairs. Uh, 16 motor driven appliances, which are your air units. The only other thing have to be refrigerators, and there's such a minor load that it doesn't really affect it. But uh, short cycling, this doesn't seem to happen as much as it used to, but uh, people would come in and Maybe the temperature's not quite where they want it and they dial it in, but they overshoot it and, and the compression drops out and then they dial it back up and try to come back in. The generator drops on its knees and then the air doesn't come on for a while. Uh, short cycling is a problem that uh, you, of course, you control. But if you overshoot it, don't worry about it. The generator's not going to quit. The air conditioner will just drop out until. Uh, the head pressure on your heat and cooling unit gets equal enough it can come back in. <clears throat> Do many of you travel in high altitudes? 
I've got some friends back home that like to go to Colorado skiing in the winter, such as that. The uh, gasoline units, you may have noticed some of them, they've got a, a, a little dial on your carburetor where you can change the altitude, which gives your air fuel mixture uh, that you need in the particular altitude that you may be. Your diesel units, no help for you guys. You're going to see it smoke a lot. You'll see black smoke, and that's purely because it's not giving enough air to go with the diesel that's going in it. Uh, this is a little sidetrack on the black smoke. We had a customer roll in a short while back, come in, and his was smoking so bad, it finally quit on him. And rolling in the service bay. And, and those of you that might have been in my place, I don't know if you remember, we've got a guy that's been there with us for 34 years. Charles, he's my main generator man. He fell two weeks ago and broke his right femur. Fell off a horse tractor. So those of you that know Charles, remember him. But getting back to the smoking, Charles slides under that guy's unit, starts laughing and rolls out with a Walmart sack. It sucked the Walmart sack up in the intake. Strange things happen, I'm saying. Oh, uh, let's see, surgeon, we don't have much trouble in anymore. Okay, let's go to some frequently asked questions. Get my glasses off where I can see. <clears throat> Does your generator charge your house battery? Everything that we've got on the grounds out here now are dependent upon your power converter to charge your house batteries. Uh, the large QDs, the 10s and 12, have a small automotive style alternator on them that will put back what it uses, but that's all. So you, you're dependent on your power converters to actually charge your house batteries. Is it practical to power the roof airs while you're traveling? Wouldn't have it any other way. It gives you some exercise for your generator if you don't use enough dry camping, and it makes it a lot more comfortable going down the road, because my wife will be washing clothes in the back while I'm driving today. Well, you're going to use less diesel on your big engine. Of course, the amount the generator uses is rather small, too. The difference is probably not enough to bother any of us as far as the financial gain we're going to get out of it, but the comfort zone, the ability to exercise your unit while you travel. I think the gains far outweigh whether you gain anything financially or not. But, you know, there, there is some, the, I guess the one thing the, the chassis engine would gain more than fuel economy it's if you're traveling, say you're out in the Rocky Mountains traveling, and that engine's getting warm, you lose that heat dissipation that it's having to dissipate out of the condenser where your, gener your generators are on your roof airs and you don't have that heat down there by the regulator. So it would help you in that, that respect. Yeah. Also, gas units, uh, have any of you, they've got two breakers on the 7,000 gasoline. Have any of you had a breaker trip? when you're running your airs, was it a 20 amp breaker that tripped? They put 20s and 30s, this is more of old man's infinite wisdom. Instead of putting two 30s, they just tried to put 20s and 30s. It probably didn't cost a nickel difference. Uh, and we had trouble with those 20s tripping, so if you had trouble again, just go get you a 30. That breaker's probably 20 bucks, and put it in and you'll solve your problem. Uh, is the generator power clean enough to run your computers? It's probably better than what you're getting off of the campground plug today. Uh, it's extremely clean. The frequency is extremely tight on them. So don't, uh, don't be scared to run any of your electronic equipment with your, with your generator. Uh, can you operate your air conditioner and microwave at the same time? Most of the cases out here, you're, you're good to run uh, on some of the small <coughs> gasoline motor homes. It's got the 25, 2800s in it. It's borderline of whether you've got enough power to run them. Let's see, what have we not hit on already? Uh, generator parts. I know everybody's not right down the street from a Cummins on in facility. There's a my history has been I owned a, a major auto parts company back in our area for years, and uh, we still use a lot of wheel fit parts when we can't get genuine ODANs. 
but there's a lot of great filter manufacturers out there. Uh, don't be weary to go out and buy a Wicks or a Fram or whatever the case might be. Filter if you can't buy a Cummins on end filter because I know everybody's not, not right down the street from a Cummins on end facility. Uh, we'll get over to a maintenance chart in a minute that'll give you some guidance on when you should change your different filters on it. I live out in the country and we have field mice, we have brown squirrels, all these little critters running around and they like to come into your generator compartment and spend the night. If you have problems with uh, such as this, this is not a Cummins Onan solution, this is a Harold Kimber solution, mothballs. You can lay a few mothballs around in your compartment and they don't like them. So chances are, if you live out of the country and have any of that going on, that will help you uh, solve that problem. What's that? Dryer sheets will work. Dryer sheets uh, will also work. What's that? Oh, you make the lights there. Okay. For those that may have added the, the lights, the LED lighting around one of your coach, he says that that seems to be a deterrent as well. Oh, this is a kind of an unusual question, but I'll touch on a couple of items. <clears throat> if you hold your start switch down, does your starter motor continue turning when the unit cranks? Because I tell everybody, when you're starting your unit, whether it's gasoline or diesel, uh, don't release that button the minute it fires. Hold it down another five seconds. The starter disengages the minute it sees oil pressure. So you're not uh, grinding on your starter drive when you hold the button down. And for those of you that have got the uh, quiet diesel units, I know you've noticed that it pauses before it starts when you hold the button down. It doesn't crank immediately. Believe it or not, we've had people roll in their shop saying, this generator just will not crank. I hold the button down, I hear a little clicking, but it never cranks. So they didn't hold it down long enough to, to get the starter to engage. But it's looking at the ambient temperature and it's preheating the unit to a temperature where it will crank and run smoothly when it does crank. So when you're starting, hold it down, give it five seconds for the generator to get up to speed and everything level off and then release the button and you're doing no harm. Now, if you're in a cold climate and you start the diesels, especially the 10s and 12s, because they're, they're a hard engine to start. If you're in a cold climate, mash stop. And when you do that, hold it down, you'll hear the fuel pump come on. That energizes your fuel pump and energizes your glow plugs. Gives it a little extra preheat boost. Then once you do that, mash your stop button, let it go through its normal cycle, and you'll notice it'll crank much, much better on all the quiet diesels, but especially the 10s and 12s. Okay, uh, synthetic oil. I personally am a firm believer in synthetic oil. I think it's a great product. Don't put it in your generator when it's brand new though. Get it run through a break-in period. I would probably go through a minimum of two oil changes before I did because uh, the synthetic is such a great lubricant. Uh, I've had people put it in one of brand new and come back and they were using oil six months later. The rings didn't see it. Such a good lubricant that the rings never see it. So break it in if you want to go to a synthetic or a blended synthetic, uh, do it at that time. But run a record mineral base oil through it until you get a good break in period. Generator care and maintenance on uh, page 29 in this book. Maybe it's the same as the new one. This chart will give you some guidance as far as when you want to uh, do your service. <clears throat> People ask me all the time, you know, when do I need to change my fuel filter? Well, as you well know, you can get dirty fuel that you don't intend to get. So it's based on uh, 450 to 500 hours uh, service intervals on your fuel filter unless you get dirty fuel. Air filters, you gotta consider where you've been. Uh, at the ball games, if they park us in the air where it's dirty and dusty and that generator fan's blowing straight down at that ground, 
it's going to steer that dust up and uh, I change my air filter once a year regardless because we do put a lot of hours on it at the ball games and uh, that way I feel pretty comfortable I'm not uh, not letting my engine get dusted. Uh, the particular oils that we put in up here on the ground when we changed years, the diesel's uh, 1540 Rotella and the uh, gasoline units are 30 weight. And you can change that based on the temperature of the air you're running in. Let's see, I may have a chart in here that, you know, uh, 33, if that's the right page, it's got a chart that gives you the temperature that you're going to be running at in a particular weight oil that you might want to use. Most of you are like me, you're probably running from cold weather and uh, running toward the warm. But if you do go out in the high country in the winter, you might want to consider changing your oil weight to, uh, to the ones they recommend here. Uh, when you pay as much money as you pay for one of these things, you typically like to keep them clean and looking good. So cleaning your generator, you know, for the most part, wipe them down with a damp cloth. Just do not get any water directly on the control area where your start stop switch is, but the rest of it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. We have a lot of people back home that, uh, like I was saying about Charles falling off the horse trailer, that have got these generators on top of their horse trailer. So they're sitting up there in the, uh, in the weather for the most part. They keep the controller covered, the rest of it sits outside. Uh, there's a small troubleshooting guide. Uh, I won't really go over all of them, but if you have problems, some of the stuff that you, you find along the way are very simple problems, just a matter of kind of knowing what to look for. So this guy will give you some, uh, some help with that. We went over the fault codes. Now the 3.2s, now we got many Wayfarer owners here all right, y'all got 3.2s in there. Of course, you don't have a start-stop switch on the unit. The only switch you got is the one inside. And uh, your trouble codes come up in a little different fashion. It actually gives you some script that tells you what's going on with your unit at that time. And if any of you have had problems with your unit recently, within the last year or less, they're having a problem right now with the diesel fuel injection, injecting pump and injectors. So at some point in time, if you haven't encountered that, you may. And at that time, you just call your, your local Cummins on in facility. They will have to ship the goods into them. The distributors, not even ours, as much as we do. We don't have them in stock. They ship it into it on a per case basis to uh, get the problem solved because they have to install this and they have to go into it with a computer and set a few things inside the software as they get it done. I've also seen on the Facebook forum that they had a problem with some units going out with some metal shavings in them, and Cummings replaced the generators. They replaced the generator, yeah. and that's what they've been doing. That's what they've been doing until recently. They finally got the fix figured out. So I'm going to say more than likely they replaced the injection pump and the injector, but they replaced them because we had uh, we had 14 of them stacked up back at my place that Cummins could not, at that time, they couldn't fix because they didn't have the fix, so they just replaced them. I'm actually in the process of trying to buy 60 of them, so it may have a lot of used parts. <laughs> All right, on page 51, I believe, and several pages following. So for those of you that like to do your own service, this is a very helpful, probably the most helpful page in the book. Let's move over to an HDKAK, which is a 6,000 quiet diesel. You'll notice if you look across that line, it gives you the spec letters, gives you the oil filter, gives you the air filter. When you get to the fuel filter, it changes. That filter changes at spec L and up. Uh, I'll touch on this on the fuel filter too. There were a few coaches that had were on Freightliner chassis, and Freightliner had a problem with getting welded slag in their fuel tanks. Well, when that fuel leaves that tank, the first place it goes to is the fuel pump. The only fuel filter is after the pump. 
So anything that comes out of the tank goes to the pump first. In a six months period, we at my shop replaced 288 fuel pumps because of welding slag. So at that point, Tiffins and uh, Freightliner decided to put an inline fuel filter before it gets to the generator. So those of you that are probably in a in the 08 to an 014 time frame, if you have a fuel related problem, like you're not getting enough fuel, if you slide under your coach, and most of these are on slide outs, between the generator fuel inlet and the metal tube and on the frame, there's a rubber hose, and in that hose there's going to be an inline fuel filter. So if you think you're having a fuel related problems, look for that filter because it is. If it's there, it will catch everything. In fact, you, you, you filter on your unit, probably never did change it because it's catching everything before it gets to it. Uh, warranty and service. These units have a two year bumper to bumper coverage, I call it, uh, except for just service items. And they have a third year of major parts and pumps generator windings, engine failures, uh, inverter controllers on your seven fives and your eights and your sixes and they're of course authorized throughout the u.s to get these done i will say this because the parts availability has been somewhat poor in the last few years as y'all well know the post-covid issues we have if you're out of state somewhere and you you go to a place and they just say they absolutely don't have the parts don't think they'll be able to get the parts call us we stock an extensive inventory of O&M parts because we do so much for Tiffany's. And uh, a lot of times we'll have parts in stock that our distributors don't have. So if you ever get caught in that trout, call us. Maybe we can help you out of it. Uh, the last few pages in the back, you'll see uh, depicted the particular generators. Uh, this is not a critical amount of help. But I guess the biggest plus in here it gives you the average fuel consumption of what your unit's going to be running. And if you're out dry camping somewhere, you would like to know how long that fuel tank's going to last. Uh, the coach care, I'll touch on it slightly. Have any of you experienced a coach care facility for service? Uh, a few around. They built these to try to get you out of the truck shop. Uh, my coach and your students probably have got light beige carpet or, or, or lighter. And that truck mechanic climbed out of that Mac and walks through the living room back to the engine in his greasy boots. So this is a the hope for, hopefully facilitate getting you a, a technician that's keeping in mind to keep the coach clean as well as fix it. So if you uh, have the need and are near one, uh, please call on them because they're they're supposed to be doing the job to get it, get it right. So I got a probably a pretty dumb question for all these people here, but uh, we never dry camp. We we don't. Even, in fact, if uh, you know, I could get rid of the generator. I'd probably get rid of it. I only thing I do to it is change the oil uh, once a year and run it. And I probably don't run it that long, I'll probably run it 10, 15 minutes every three or four months and never have used it for electricity. What did so what it? we, what, uh, so how should I go about doing it? Because we- Do you use it anyway when you're traveling on the highway? No. Why would we? No, I'm, I'm, I'm so being coach, serious. Your coach is comfortable enough. Yeah. So you're not in some really hot weather. We have never been, we never been, <laughs> we're from Ohio. Okay. And in right. the summer we go, we go, Ohio, uh, we go uh, north, and in the winter we go south, and honestly, we're always at it. I'm just curious, yeah. what would be the minimum that I can do just to be able to... 30 minutes a month. 30 minutes a month, change oil once a year, and... It'll be there if yeah. we ever do go dry camping or yeah, you why should we want to go to Texas shape. in the summer. But, uh, I like to see them ran more, but in your situation, if you're just not where you can run it, 30 minutes a month is the bare minimum I would try to run it. Oh, the soft starts. 
for a generator or the air conditioners? Those are not a problem? No, they're not. No, soft starts, no problem at all. Would you go, go back through the cold start on the generator where you say push the button down? Yeah, the, cold, the, yeah, the, the question is the cold start. Uh, if you're in a, a cold climate, and when I say cold climate, probably 40 degrees or less, uh, mash stop. If you got a 10 or a 12, that can use it. Okay, you got 10 or 12, they're extremely hard to crank. So hold it down a good 10 seconds, maybe 15. I mean, if I was in sub freezing weather, I'd probably hold it down another 15 seconds. All that does is energize your glow plugs and your fuel pumps. So it gets your fuel system primed up good, gets your glow plugs already preheated. Then go ahead and mash start. It's going to go through the whole cycle and then it'll crank. You'll find it'll crank much, much easier. You're saying hold the button down. I'm stopped. I'll stop. Yeah. 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 You hear your fuel pump run. If uh, you needed to, if you got to your site and you had no power and you needed to jump start your generator, is that possible? It is. And a lot of coaches have got a boost switch on on the dash where you can mash it. It locks your house and your chassis batteries together and cranks it. But if you don't have a boost switch on it. Yeah, you can. Uh, you need to boost off of your house batteries. We'll crank the generator. Your house batteries are dead or, uh, from storage, from being in storage. Yeah, you need to boost off your house batteries. Boost off your house. Yeah. And I, I will say this too: most of them, if you crank your chassis, uh, it shoots after about 60 seconds. It has a a device on there that gives it the ability to charge the house and chassis. So you usually crank the chassis, they didn't run a little bit and get enough voltage to crank them. And, and your, your, your generators always come off your chassis battery? House. They always come off your house battery? Always. Okay. Yeah. If your house battery is dead, it, then your backup is to boost to going to your chassis battery. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, can I run my house off this generator? Yes, absolutely. So I could put a 50 amp plug on it? Yeah, absolutely. We do that a lot shop. Uh, of course, we live down in tornado country. Sometimes power might be off two or three weeks after a storm comes through. So we've had a lot of customers come in that want to rig it up to where they can plug up to the, uh, the generator on the coach and, and plug it to their house. Now, we'll say this. If you're going to do this and run your house, the Really, the only way I would like to see it done is it puts you a manual transfer switch on your house. And this is if you're going to have this for a regular usage. I know sometimes in emergencies you can't do all of the ins and outs to get where you need to be. But if you've got a transfer switch on your house, even if it's manual, it takes it out of the utility company and puts it on the generator. That way you don't feed voltage down the line and kill the line from working on the tower somewhere. Right, now the reason I asked this is because I've read a couple of places where the two sides for the load are in sync instead of being out of sync for 240. Now, have you got, what size generator have you got? 8,000. 8,000, you're not going to have 240 at all. You're going to have two legs of 120 volts. Now, the 10s and the 12s, leg to leg will be 240, and leg to ground will be 120. But your generator is really a DC generator with a big inverter inside the cabinet that changes it to AC. So you have two legs of 120 but no 240. So no way to run any 240. No way to run 240. Perfect. The only way you can run 240 is have your small transformer set at your house where it would transform with the 120 to 240 and that would get pretty costly and probably not worth the trouble for uh, emergency use. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the question I have, like, is this common that uh, the hour meter on the generator does not show no hours, but on the spider in the Tiffin it does? The one on the generator is not showing any hour no, it's, it's still reading zero. It's probably a loose connection if I was going to guess. No, it should, it should read. You will occasionally see the generator on the unit with more hours than the one inside, because they test on these units sometimes for as much as two hours. And uh, so one, sometimes on the generator will have a larger hour meter reading than the one inside. But no, it should be running concurrently with your or right inside the right connection. Right, Sorry. right underneath the meter? I pulled the meter up and looked right underneath it. It's got uh, some spade connectors yeah. that plug onto it. Yeah. Probably one of those. Okay. And then the follow-up on the oil, though. 
I didn't really go through your maintenance thing here, but um, you change by hour and calendar, or just? Well, he was doing, uh, you said every year. Cal cal calendar, it, that's not really a Cummins uh, rule, I guess I could say. That's a Harold rule. I just say, if you don't run it enough to get 150 hours a year on it, you're going to get some moisture that's you will get condensation inside the crankcase just because in that area the humidity is so damn high. So, you know, you, you have that. And uh, my philosophy is the cost of oil to filter is cheap yeah. compared to engine loss. Okay, thank you. When you change the oil yourself in the generator, do you run it so it's warm before you change it or do you change no, it? No, change the cold. Change the cold and crank them, be sure the filter don't leak, put the lid back on. And in your own generator, after you've broken it in for a few years, do you use synthetic or the regular oil? No, I use, I use synthetic and everything I own. Okay. Yeah. We also have a line of commercial lawn equipment, one of the, the companies I own, and, and they use synthetic in the engines and the hydros and everything. And I've seen what synthetic oil does inside of a hydro pump that's got 3,000 hours on it. And uh, that's the reason I'm running everything. Anybody else? I, I recently purchased an older unit that's got a tent. It had been in storage for two and a half years with nothing done to it. When I go to start the generator, it is dragging really bad. You mentioned grains that would. When you say dragging, you're talking about the starter hard to turn? Yeah, it, it, it's like it's not like the where's your Where's your batteries located? They're all the way in the back, the generators in the front. Well, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit costly because coppers went through the roof recently. But you need to parallel you another positive battery cable all the way from the battery to the generator, and your problem will go away. If it's range dragging or whatnot, it's just running it. Will it work its way out? No. It's the nature of the beast. They. I've got some that have the batteries in the left front of the coach and the generator, of course, it's real easy. You've got a six-foot piece of cable uh, to parallel another wire in there. And, and, but it's just the nature of that generator. That, that Kubota engine is hard to start. And uh, if you parallel you another wire, you probably see your prop go completely away. And what you might do if you wanted to experiment before you go buy the cable is uh, get you a 12 volt booster cable, hook it to a, either a vehicle or a loose battery or whatever you can do to reach underneath the generator, clip on the positive post on the back of it, and the negative, see if it cranks. If it cranks up, go, go buy you some cable. 